with our floor show. Joining me now, Slate Stone Wealth's Chief Market Strategist, Kenny Polkari, and CFRA Research Chief Investment Strategist, Sam Stovall. Kenny, let me start with you. How much of a headwind is a 4% yield on these equity markets? I think it could be a fairly decent headwind, consider, especially if people are considering that we're going to run into uh, kind of an economic slowdown uh, and maybe uh, a decline in earnings. Not that I'm saying it's going to happen, but if that's what people think is going to happen, then locking in 4% for some of their money, uh, I think, will prove to be a headwind for, for stocks. And if we see yields continue to go higher, that's just going to be more and more of a headwind uh, as we move through. Sam, we're at a 5690 on the S&P. I mentioned at the top of the show, Goldman goes to 6000, Main Street goes to 6200. How do you see this market playing out through this October surprise and through the end of the year? Hey, Taylor. Well, I think that uh, we probably could end a year uh, higher than where we are now, about 5850. Uh, I think that we are going through your fairy tr fairly traditional uh, October volatility. Let's remember, it's about 35 percent more volatile than the average for the other 11 months of the year. Uh, and we are certainly getting head scratching data in terms of oil prices, Mideast tension, uh, looking at the 10 year yield, also gold and the VIX. Uh, uh, and so I think possibly setting us up for uh, possibly a little more of a slide. But I would tend to think that the seasonals will be favorable as we conclude the year. You have both of you have mentioned oil. Um, Kenny, how much of an impact should we be seeing on energy stocks if oil continues this climb higher? Uh, listen, uh, energy and oil have been names that I've liked all along, even when they were selling off on the you know waning demand story, which I never really bought into. But now that we've seen oil rallying back up, certainly on the Mideast conflict, I understand it, that that's why oil is rallying up. But after China, you know, they threw the bazooka at their economy trying to turn it around. If we see them talk at all about Chinese demand picking up, once again, energy names and fossil fuel names are going to continue to move higher because, look, the world needs energy. Who's kidding who? And solar just isn't going to do it at the moment. And so I'm, uh, I remain bullish on energy stocks and energy names. Sam, what energy stock do you like? Well, we tend to favor some of the uh, the larger ones uh, uh, like Exxon Mobil, uh, also looking at EOG resources. Um, I would also caution, however, that uh, high oil prices can also be their own undoing. Uh, every $10 increase in the price of oil that is sustained uh, has proven to take off anywhere from 15 to 20 basis points of real GDP. Uh, so. We are likely to see a spike if we see uh, Mideast retaliation hit some of the Iranian oil depots. Uh, but I think should cooler heads prevail, we'll probably end up seeing oil prices come back down to the $70 per barrel area. Sam, I'm chuckling. You're the second person today that's mentioned EOG resources to me. I heard somewhere the break even for them is about $39 a barrel. So oil at 70 or 80 certainly is helpful in terms of profitability for these companies. Um, Kenny, I want to come back to you as well in terms of some of the financials. Big week of earnings this week. The financials really start to kick off the main part of it on Friday. Do you like the big bulge yeah. brackets or are you thinking maybe more the regionals? No, I like the big bulge brackets. J.P. Morgan and Bank of America are my two favorites. We saw what Jamie Dimon did a couple of weeks ago. He came out ahead of the earnings season telling analysts to, to pull back on their estimates because he thought they were being a little bit too um, uh, 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 too um, uh, upbeat on uh, net interest income, right? So he wanted to alert the market that he thought they should come back. And, in fact, they took a little bit out of the stock on that day, which I think was the right thing to do because investors hate – when companies miss the number and they know damn well they're going to miss the number and they don't forewarn to give kind of the market a, a heads up. In this case, I think even if J.P. Morgan numbers, if they come in a little bit light and it's because of net interest income, I don't think it's going to nearly have as negative reaction as it would have had he not uh, forewarned. Right. So in my case, I like the big names. I told you those two are my favorites and I remain invested in them and will look to buy more if it pulls back. Sam, what about you? Uh, well, typically we see uh, the, the global banks, which we do like more so over the regionals. Some of the regionals we go for, such as Fifth Third, uh, and we also like M&T Bank. Um, so, but the, the larger ones, I agree with Kenny. Uh, 
JP Morgan Chase is one that we favor. Uh, basically, we're also looking at a seasonally lower period for net revenues and for earnings between uh, the June and September quarters. So I think we have to realize that seasonality. The larger uh, banks typically are not going to be affected by net interest income pressures. Uh, we'll probably end up seeing some of that offset by capital markets, by the Treasury area and custodial services, as well as wealth management. Really smart conversation with both of you. I'm grateful. Kenny Polkari and Sam Stovall. <laughs> Thanks so much.